from many sources. Water is one source. Um, when we drink that water and when it's made into soda pop or it's made into beverages and made into soups, made into other products, we get fluoride from that source also. And we also have a lot of pesticides that have come on the market that leave fluoride residues on fruits and vegetables. Fluoride is a very common component in pesticides. And so, uh, you know, if you drink a glass of grape juice, uh, that's a non-organic grape juice and it's got skins on it, you're going to get a very high level of fluoride just from your grape juice. And they're also getting it from toothpaste. Studies have shown that you swallow quite a bit of toothpaste, or the children swallow quite a bit of toothpaste. Uh, even if they're you know, told not to swallow it, uh, it just happens by accident. They, they don't rinse as well as adults and sometimes they don't have as good as swallowing actions. And therefore they're getting a lot of fluoride from that. So who's monitoring this exposure of when are we getting too much? No one's monitoring that. Nobody's looking at the total exposure to ensure that we're not getting too much and that certain subgroups aren't getting too much. The reality is we need to reduce our fluoride intake. In 2005, the Center of Disease Control admitted that 32% of our children in the United States, including children in non-fluoridated areas, have dental fluorosis. About a third of the children in this country have some form of dental fluorosis, meaning that they had too much fluoride exposure during their early childhood. Dental fluorosis is damage to the tooth because of too much fluoride exposure. We swallowed too much fluoride and it shows up as white spots, brown spots on the teeth. You see these white spots uh, or splotches or lines. Uh, in, in more severe fluorosis you actually see the surface layer flaking off you see brown spots. And in severe cases, uh, there's actual chipping and pitting and, and erosion of the tooth. Dental fluorosis is a biomarker that your child has been overexposed to fluoride during the development of their teeth. We now believe that there are several mechanisms involved. Fluoride could be inhibiting the enzymes, the serine proteinases that are degrading the final traces of proteins that are left behind in the teeth. The mechanisms have something to do with interference with the enamel forming proteins or inhibition of some enzymes during that critical period. To do that, uh, impacting those, uh, uh, the enamel cells and the teeth means that it can also impact cells elsewhere in the body. The promoters have always had this faith that you could damage the growing tooth enamel, the enzymes, the G proteins, or however that happens, without damaging any other tissue in the body at the same time. And I think that's very unlikely. Not only does it, is it an effect on teeth, what's happening in the teeth is, is very likely happening in the bone as well because the, we have a similar kind of structure of, of a hydroxyapatite a mineral structure in the bone and the tooth. Uh, your teeth are sort of a, a window into the bone, a window into your skeleton. So if there's this adverse effects going on in, in the teeth, there are very likely to be adverse effects going on in the bone. It's a, a sign of toxicity. It is not just to be take or dismissed as, as merely a cosmetic effect. This whole debate has been captured for over 50 years by the dental lobby, by dentists whose preoccupation is teeth, well, teeth are not the only issue in the body. As dentists, we diagnose pathology of the mouth, diseases of the mouth. And we tend to disregard or not involve ourselves with the diseases of the rest of the body because it's not within our purview, it's not within our license to diagnose other parts of the body. Most definitely, the dental community has uh, had a, a monopoly, if you will, on the study of fluoride. And they have absolutely... Uh, put use tunnel vision to look at fluoride as a, a dental concern. However, it is not just a, a dental concern. It's a toxicity concern. The National Research Council has a report that just came out in 2006, which is one of the best sources of finding out what fluoride is doing to the rest of the body. One of the most interesting things in the report is the diversity of the number of organs that are being affected by the fluoride beyond either the teeth or the bones. We, we do need to get away from looking only at 
fluoride in connection with teeth, we need to be considering its effect on a whole bunch of other systems in the body, on, on people's general health in a whole lot of respects. I think the ADA's recent statement on warning against adding fluoridated water to baby formula is a uh, watershed uh, decision. The American Dental Association has finally done what it should have done years ago, and that is to tell parents not to use fluoridated tap water to make up formula. The American Dental Association recommends that we not uh, have fluoridated water be used for making infant formula or for infants to, to drink. One of the messages which I think is extraordinary in this whole issue is that the level of fluoride in mother's milk is so extremely low. It's 0 0.004 parts per million, which is 250 times less than we put in the drinking water. There have been a couple um, men who have said, well, maybe mother's milk is flawed. But most scientists don't go that route. They say mother's milk seems to be the best we have, the best we know of, and if it's low in fluoride, maybe that's what we should have for infants is low fluoride. Nature has devised a system for keeping fluoride away from the infant, and we're circumventing that by putting fluoride into drink water. And I think there are consequences. I think parents should know that fluoride is an extremely active chemical when it gets into our body. It can interfere with the pineal gland. It can interfere with the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland and the pineal gland are both intimately involved with brain development, mental development. A real concern with, with, with young kids, especially with, with newborn infants, is that the, the blood-brain barrier is not fully developed at that point. And when uh, children are drinking a formula made with uh, fluoridated drinking water, they're, they're getting a, a huge an inappropriate dose of fluoride in the developing brain. This may be part of the reason, for instance, of the depression of IQ that we've seen in these Chinese studies. You do not want to create a fluoride exposure during a period of brain vulnerability. All of these things are indicators, serious indicators, that you shouldn't expose young babies to fluoride. And of course that's exactly what happens when you put fluoride in the water. How are low-income kids supposed to, or low-income families, supposed to avoid giving their kids fluoridated water? They can't afford to avoid it. They can't afford to seek sources of, of drinking water uh, that has uh, no fluoride in it. I think that the low-income communities could be at higher risk for adverse effects from fluoride exposure or from water fluoridation. As far as I can see, there is no doubt that the uh, intake of fluoridated water is going to interrupt basic functions of nerve cells in the brain. The NRC committee did review the available information of, on fluoride effects on the brain on neurological uh, function, and we concluded that, that there does seem to be evidence for some effects there needs to be more study of several areas. There certainly seem to be effects on the developing brain, but there may also be effects on, on the brain in older individuals as well. The research on the brain uh, since our study was published has uh, absolutely confirmed uh, what we, we predicted and what we reported in 1995. There are now 30 animal studies which indicate that fluoride could damage the brain. And this comes on top of a number of studies from China which indicates that fluoride lowers IQ in children. I mean, there's lots of epidemiological evidence now that, for example, it might affect the intelligence of the child coming out of China, and that's been reviewed by the National Academy of Sciences. They say that you can't be absolutely certain about it, but there's quite a strong indication, and we need further research. In my view, a fluoride today, as far as intelligence and the brain is concerned is where lead was in the early 70s. In the early 70s scientists knew that high levels of lead could cause brain damage in children and other health effects but they felt that subclinical levels of lead were okay. I think the same thing is happening now with fluoride that it's only a function of getting more and more sensitive tests 